Hello everyone and welcome to my description of how I'm building my layout and a few ideas that I've picked up over the years. Very few of them are original and you might disagree with some of them but I find that they work for me. My layout room is 3.2 by 8.1 metres and occupies almost half of an 8 by 8 metre brick garage built partly with that in mind. It's fully insulated and in winter it's often the warmest place to be. Baseboard construction commenced in 2009 and a template plan was drawn up. I decided to dive in at the deep end rather than experiment with a small shunting plank. Though I've made a few mistakes on the way, quite a lot actually, I certainly don't regret this decision. Most of the baseboards are 8 foot by 3 foot MDF supported on 6 inch deep beams produced by sandwiching off cuts of MDF between two lengths of 3 mm ply. The MDF is glued to the ply with PVA glue. This photograph of a section of a transverse beam shows the method of construction. Here I should point out that Australian MDF seems to be a different animal from that sold in the UK and is very stable, at least in the environment in which I use it. It might be prudent to check for a suitable alternative in the UK. The longitudinal beams are up to 8 feet in length and the transverse beams fit between and have holes to permit the passage of wiring. Because I was aware of my disinclination for forward planning, the transverse beams can be moved to the left or right after erection if necessary in order to avoid any sub-baseboard gubbins that might need to be installed as the layout progresses. So far, that has not proved necessary. If I need to screw anything to the front of the front beam, I simply push another piece of MDF up between the ply sheets if there isn't one where I want to install the screws and it usually isn't necessary to glue the MDF block. Similarly, if I want holes to permit me to bring wires through the front beam, I insert a piece of MDF which prevents the outer sheet of ply from splintering when the drill breaks through. It also makes it far easier to push the wires through because they cannot wander off inside the cavity. In an attempt to develop my skills, I started by building turnouts and laying track for a seven-road fiddle yard. The turnouts at one end are completed and laid. Those at the other are built but not yet installed because getting track all of the way around the room is a higher priority. I'm by no means a track expert despite the fact that I've built a lot of it. I can't aspire to building the exquisite track produced by my friend Michael Godfrey and showcased in several issues of Scale 4 News. I console myself with the thought that, given the amount that I need, I simply don't have the time. I want track that works and is a reasonable representation of that built by the Great Western Railway in the early years of the 20th century. Here are a diamond crossing and two turnouts constructed but not yet installed at the other end of the fiddle yard. The layout will eventually be a looped figure of eight on two levels with a maximum gradient of one in a hundred between them. The two laps of the room are close to complete thanks largely to pressure from Melbourne fine scale group members who want a continuous run on which to test their locomotives. Meetings here always see members running their latest creations but I have yet to tackle a locomotive myself and I'm quite nervous about the idea. The templates inside the oval are for point and crossing work that's built off layout. It's planned that the side of the room opposite the fiddle yard will be occupied by a station modelled loosely on the layouts at Chipping Sodbury and Badminton on the Great Western Main Line to South Wales. This is where I'm up to at the moment. The track is being laid onto template templates glued with photomat spray adhesive onto blue foam sheeting that was given to me by a fellow member of the Melbourne Fine Scale Modellers Group over 40 years ago and sat in storage for at least half of that time. It has shown no sign whatsoever of deteriorating so I'm confident that it will outlast me but I've seen other foam sheeting crumble away after a few years. This is the template plan that was used to construct the components of the slip ladder off baseboard. 
And this is the first turnout and single slip after installation. The holes are for the wiring droppers. They were made with plunge router fitted with the smallest bit available from Bunnings, the Australian equivalent of B&Q. This makes far less mess than using a drill. They will eventually be filled in, but that is currently a low priority. This view shows the entire slip ladder in situ. My track is constructed using Code 75 steel rail, which I solder with resin cord solder, but using 5% or 10% phosphoric acid as a flux. I have a lifetime supply of acid, which I dilute as needed. When diluting acid, always add the acid to the water. Adding water to acid can be dangerous because it can cause the acid to boil and spit. I've had no problem with the rail rusting due to the flux, but it certainly doesn't like PVA glue, which emits acetic acid as it dries. This photograph shows the materials that I have used, most of which are available from the Scale 4 stores. For straight track in the fiddle yard and on other parts of the layout outside the planned scenic section, I've used C&L flexible sleeper bases. In the scenic section, I'm building track with two bolt functional exacto scale chairs glued to stained plywood sleepers with butanone solvent. Though this shows nickel silver rail, I don't plan to use it. Though I have copper clad sleepers on hand, I've not used them for track construction. At least, not in the way in which they were intended. I stain my sleepers with a mixture of Indian ink and water. In his book on track construction, Ian Rice suggests adding isopropyl alcohol to the mixture, which I no longer do since purchasing a new bottle of Windsor & Newton ink and finding that the IPA coagulates the ink, rendering the mixture useless. As an alternative, one can purchase wood stain of an appropriate colour. I use 36mm sleepers to represent the 9-foot versions used in pre-grouping days. Those that you see here came from the EM Gauge Society with pre-punched holes for track rivets. On curved track outside the scenic area, I have used rivet and ply. The brass track rivets are designed for 00 and EM Gauge track. These can be used for P4 track unless you plan to add cosmetic chairs. The copper rivets are for P4 and S4. These have smaller heads. I'm fortunate enough to have a rivet press for closing the rivets when building ply and rivet track. Unfortunately, these have been unavailable for some time, though there has been some discussion recently on making them available once more. The Scale 4 stores catalogue indicates that they are sometimes available second hand. Also, there's an article on building your own press in issue 220 of Scale 4 News. Here's some of my rivet and ply track. Those who have the stamina apply cosmetic half chairs. The remainder of my track and all of my point work is constructed with ply sleepers and functional chairs. It's easier to stain the sleeper strip after cutting it to length. Functional chairs have been available from the trade for some time. Originally from K&L and subsequently from C&L Finescale, they're now produced by Exacto Scale and are available from the Scale 4 Society and EM Gauge Society stores. This photograph shows those that I've used. They shouldn't be stored for too long because they become brittle with age, which makes it almost impossible to thread them onto Code 75 rail without breaking them in half, after which they are only useful as cosmetic half chairs. You can see a range of running rail chairs still on their sprues. The two on the left are very old and virtually useless. The shape of the chairs is also noticeably different from the newer Exacto scale ones. Check rail chairs from Exacto scale come in two varieties, those for 00 and EM and those for P4. The latter have narrower flangeway gaps. There's an allowance for a flare at each end of the check rail because the chairs at each end of the sprue produce a slightly wider gap between stock and check rail, though you need to look very closely to spot this.
Brittleness isn't a problem for these old slide chairs because they're never under any stress once installed. Exacto Scale also produced two varieties of slide chair, one for double O and EM and the other for P4. There are also brass versions of these, but they are currently in very short supply. The smaller L1 and M1 chairs are for point and crossing work, though other options are now available. I was down to my last M1 chair when this photograph was taken, but I have now replenished my supply. They are also available in brass. Here we see a range of fish plates. The plastic versions are used where an insulation gap is needed between adjacent rail ends. I have used a lot of the old Pico N-scale joiners on my off-scene track. They were purchased years ago. The Scale Force Society digest sheets that are available to members tell you all that you need to know about track building. It's well worth joining the Society for these and for access to the stores and for the newsletter. There's also a long thread by Tony Wilkins on the Scale 4 forum which details his methods and it's a valuable resource for anyone constructing a layout to fine scale standards or indeed for anyone contemplating building track. Track gauges are essential. The Brooks Smith gauges are the Rolls Royce but, alas, they are no longer available. The check gauge and crossing flangeway gauge are particularly useful, in fact essential. And fortunately, both are available to members from the Scale 4 stores. In P4, the width of the check rail gap is 0.68mm and, as good fortune would have it, this is exactly the thickness of a few worn hacksaw blades that I have. But obviously, a gauge cut down from one has to be dead straight, free from burrs and, obviously, used the right way up. As you can see, I have five triangular gauges which were purchased over the years. The three newer ones on the left are available from the Scale Force stores. My three are not identical. One of them has a firmer grip on the railhead than the other two. The mint gauge is very useful for checking track for gauge. I wouldn't be without mine. It's helped me to find and eliminate tight spots, particularly on curved track. I use these gauges, of which I have 10, for laying plain straight track. The pin is inserted on the centre line and the rails laid with the slots in the jigs setting the gauge. If you use template to plan your track, the centre line is shown on the template. Even without template, it's a simple matter to draw the centre line on a straight track template. As far as I know, these are no longer being produced, which is a great pity because I find mine very useful indeed. And these are very useful for checking gauge widening on curves. The plane gauge on the left is 18.83mm, the next with one band is 18.93, then 19.03 and 19.13. Here we see three of the gauges on curved rivet and ply track. The triangular track gauge will automatically produce gauge widening if used as seen here. If the apex of the triangular gauge is on the outer rail, it will produce gauge narrowing. After laying the track, it's prudent to check the gauge with a roller gauge or better still with a mint gauge. This gauge from the Scale 4 Society gives automatic widening on curves. Though not a track gauge, this gauge for checking the back-to-back -back distance between wheels is essential. Finally, a useful multi-gauge for checking a range of dimensions. So much for plain track. There's a range of aids available for the construction of turnouts which I find very helpful but others manage perfectly well without them. I modelled the Great Western Railway, which constructed turnouts with joggle stock rails. To aid in producing the joggles in model form, a member of our group had a custom tool made in case-hardened steel. It needs a substantial bench vise to press the jaws together, and the joggle produced is slightly over scale. In use, it's most convenient to insert two lengths of rail with heads, or feet, 
facing one another and joggle them simultaneously. This saves time and exerts an even force across the tool. The jigs in this photograph were, I believe, created for the South Hampshire group and originally produced by Portsdown Models. They are now available from the EM Gauge Society and Scale 4 Society stores, but they're not cheap. The first is my switchblade planing jig. It's double-sided and the visible side is for B and C turnouts. The other side is for A and D. The other two jigs are for producing common crossing Vs. The smaller one is for 1 in 5, 1 in 6, 1 in 7 and 1 in 8 crossings and the larger is for 1 in 9, 1 in 10, 1 in 11 and 1 in 12 crossings. I added the second bolt and large washer. My jigs came with instruction sheets which I found somewhat less than clear so I wrote my own to remind me how to proceed. You'll need a good sharp file that is large enough for the job. I keep one that was purchased specifically for the purpose and it's not used for anything else. Don't even contemplate using a needle file. The file should have a blind edge. Before starting, ensure that the end of the rail to be filed is cut straight and then identify the head and the foot of the rail. When using the jig, the way in which the rail is inserted will depend upon whether you're building a right hand or a left hand turnout. I'll describe the arrangement for a right hand turnout. It doesn't matter whether you file up the point rail or the splice rail first, but if you get one of them the wrong way up in the jig, you'll end up with two point rails or two splice rails. This isn't a major tragedy as I've discovered for myself more than once. I usually start by filing the point rail. This is the rail that's traversed when the turnout is normal. It's usually on the straight road. Insert the rail into the slot in the jig appropriate for the V angle that you want. For the point rail, for a right hand switch, the foot of the rail should be towards the jig. Set the end of the rail slightly proud of the edge of the jig and clamp it with the bolt and washer and hold the jig in a vise. You can see that the rail here is not hard down in the slot in the jig, but this doesn't matter because the file will push it into the slot if you file in the direction shown in the next slide. Filing the other way will damage the rail. File until you're about halfway through the web. If you file too far, you can cut the sharp end off and clean up with wet and dry paper. After filing, it should look like this. Next, remove the rail from the jig and carefully clean up any burrs. The tip is quite fragile. Then, use a pair of smooth jawed pliers to bend the filed portion so that it's parallel to the other side of the rail. Take great care to ensure that the bend line is perpendicular to the rail to avoid producing a V that kicks up or down at its tip. If this happens, you'll have to start again because it's virtually impossible to correct. Check the bend against a straight edge. In this case, the rail is not bent quite far enough. The inset might make this slightly more obvious. That's better. Now reinsert the rail in the jig with the head towards the jig for a point rail for a right hand turnout. File away the head and foot of the rail, but take care not to break through the web. If in doubt, it's better to have insufficient rail protruding from the jig. You can always push it out a little further, but you can't solve the problem of filing too much away. When you're happy with your efforts, remove the rail and carefully clean off any burrs. I rub the head and then the foot of the rail on fine grade wet and dry paper to do this. The next task is to file the splice rail, which is the rail that's traversed when the turnout is reversed. It's usually, but not always, on the diverging road. To file up the splice rail, repeat the actions for the point rail, except that the first step is to insert the rail into the slot in the jig 
with the head of the rail towards the jig. Then bend the filed face of the rail as before. Reinsert the rail with the foot towards the jig and proceed as for the point rail. When soldering the splice rail to the point rail, it's essential that the two rails be coplanar. For this, it's necessary to use a jig that will also hold the two rails at the correct angle. It's possible to use the planing jig as shown here. Alternatively, it's possible to use a homemade jig similar to this one made from a scrap of MDF, two pieces of tufnol and a piece of L-section aluminium with one side cut and filed to the angle of the V, in this case 1 in 8. I've attached it to the MDF with a length of cotton and an eyelet because otherwise I know that I'd put it down and then spend at least five minutes looking for it. Ignore the 8 to 1 marking as it's upside down. High melting point solder is used to solder the splice rail to the point rail and because I use steel rail I employ 5% phosphoric acid as a flux as I mentioned earlier. Here are some completed V's. The one at the top is soldered to two pieces of 6mm copper clad ready for the next part of the operation which is to make up the wing rails and attach them to the V's to produce the common crossing. I complete the common crossing before attaching it to the sleepers. Others prefer to install the V first and then set up the wing rails. It's simply a matter of choice. The next step is to prepare the wing rails. I find it useful to cut a small nick in the rail where the knuckle is to be formed. The nick shouldn't cut into the web. I use a jig to hold the rail for making the cut. There are three advantages to doing this although it's not prototypical as some have pointed out. Firstly, it ensures that the bend line is perpendicular to the length of the rail, which is essential. Secondly, if the cutting mark on the jig is correctly located, the centre of the bend will be exactly at the correct distance from the end of the rail. In any case, the distance from the mark to the end of the block must obviously not be less than the distance from the end of the wing rail to the knuckle. Thirdly, when the rail is placed on the jig for producing the common crossing, the nick in the head of the rail makes it easier to see where the centre of the bend is located, which makes positioning the rail much easier. This is the jig that I use. It consists of a base made from a rectangle of MDF, at the end of which is attached a piece of aluminium angle held proud of its surface by a distance equal to the width of the rail to be bent. The other leg of the aluminium angle is hard up against the end of the block. The rail is slid into the slot hard up against the vertical section of the aluminium angle and the nick is made. The second rail is inserted the other way up so that it can be bent in the opposite direction from the first. The photograph shows a length of rail inserted into the jig ready for nicking and one wing rail bent, cut to length and ready to form part of a common crossing. The bend angle should match the angle of the V and can be adjusted to get it exactly correct. The next step is to complete the common crossing. This is most easily done using another simple homemade jig. The EM Gauge Society manual gives instructions on how to do this and even provides a suitable etch. But like so many things in our hobby, there are several equally effective methods. Here's one that I constructed using the etch, but any piece of 25 thou brass strip would do. The etch is 25 thou or 0.65 millimetres thick. This equates very closely to the P4 flange way gauge of 0.68 millimetres. The other critical dimensions are the width of the slots, which is 4 millimetres to accommodate the crossing timbers, and their separation, which is 6 millimetres. The length and width of the strip are not critical. The etch is sandwiched between two pieces of aluminium angle from Bunnings, the Australian equivalent of B&Q, mounted at a slot routed in a piece of MDF. Because the crossing sleepers will sit in the slots in the brass strip, the ends of the crossing rails 
will need to be packed up from the aluminium. Here is an alternative method of jig construction. This jig belongs to Melbourne Fine Scale Group member Bruce Boldner and consists of a piece of 25 thou aluminium strip sandwiched between two pieces of aluminium channel. In this case, the rail is supported by two pieces of ply timbering. If you're constructing track using functional chairs, the V will have to be packed up by a distance equal to the thickness of the sleepers plus the thickness of the base of the chairs. This shows how I use the jig. First, I tin the underside of the V. If high melting point solder was used in its construction and you're quick with the iron, it won't fall apart. If it does, curse profusely and start again. Then, tin several pieces of 0.6mm copper clad and install two of them in the jig as shown here. Sometimes I actually cut these pieces of copper clad lengthwise in order to double my supply. Place the V on the copper clad and use one or two clips to hold it firm against the brass edge. The rail foot must also be firmly against the surface of the jig. Take great care to ensure that it's not standing proud. Solder the two pieces of copper clad to the V. Plenty of flux and quickly in and out. Now place two more pieces of tinned copper clad in the adjacent slits in the edge. Place the crossing flangeway gauge against the V, position the wing rail and hold it tightly in place with a clip straddling the wing rail, the gauge and the adjacent rail of the V. This takes a bit of practice but it's essential that the wing rail is hard up against the gauge and that the gauge is hard up against the V. The wing rail must also be hard down on the copper clad and the supporting styrene sheet. If it isn't, the V and wing rail won't be coplanar. When you're happy that everything is as it should be, solder the wing rail to all four pieces of copper clad, then remove the unit and admire what you've done so far. The first wing rail is now attached to the V, both mechanically and electrically. It might look a little messy at this stage, particularly with this brutal enlargement, but don't worry, it'll clean up soon. You can also see that the knuckle is gently curved, which is as it should be. Now we add the second wing rail. To do this, replace what you've produced so far onto the jig, but this time with the V and the first wing rail sandwiching the edge, and clip them in place, again making sure that the assembly is pressed hard down against the surface of the jig. Position the second wing rail, clip it to the jig, insert the flangeway gauge and clip it in position as shown. Again, check that everything is pressed down firmly against the jig and that the knuckles on the two wing rails are lined up. Solder the second wing rail to the copper clad strips. Carefully remove the assembly from the jig and inspect. Oh dear! Careful inspection reveals that the two knuckle joints aren't aligned. Don't be tempted to continue and hope for the best. It's a lot easier to deal with it now. It should be possible to dismantle this and reattach the wing rails properly, though copper clad doesn't take too kindly to repeated application of heat. That's much better. Now check that the assembly is coplanar by inverting it onto a flat surface. It shouldn't rock. When you're completely happy, cut off the surplus copper clad and store it for next time. Then file back any that is still left until it's flush with the rail foot. Here are a couple of left hand crossings that are nearly finished. You can see that I've yet to clean up the copper clad. You might also notice that I've made them with copper clad strip that had been reduced in width by slitting it lengthwise as I mentioned earlier. I did this before soldering it up. It's not essential but I think it gives a neater result. The next job is to file up the switch blades. For this I use the Ports Down Models Jig as sold by the Scale 4 Society and the EM Gauge Society. You'll also need a reasonably large file with a safe edge, that is, an edge that's smooth. 
The one that I use is kept exclusively for filing crossing Vs and switch blades. The safe edge is just visible in this picture. Good practice dictates that the file should have a handle for safety. As you can see, mine has not. I also reserve a small file for cleaning up if necessary. Select two pieces of rail with square ends that are free from burrs and clamp both in the parallel grooves in the jig using the bolt and washer. The ends of the rails should be flush with the end of the jig and the rail feet should be facing inwards, that is, towards one another. Because of the camera angle, this is not obvious in the upper rail in this photograph, but it's clearer in the lower one and very clear in the next picture. Place the guide block over the rails, locate with the pin and secure with the screw. The jig here is set up for filing B blades. Clamp the jig firmly in a vise that's big enough to hold it securely. I use a four and a half inch bench vise, which is quite substantial. Use the file with its safe edge towards the guide block to file away the head of the first rail until the rail is flush with the face of the jig. Then repeat for the other one. Remove the guide block. You might find that there is still a trace of the rail head left on the rail. This can be removed with a few more file strokes, carefully using the foot of the rail as a guide for the safe edge of the file. Alternatively, use a small file such as the one shown earlier. In either case, take care not to file the rail foot. Remove both rails and check for burrs. Turn both rails over and reinsert them in the grooves. The filed surfaces should now be facing downwards. Clamp them with the bolt and washer, but don't install the guide block. Then file both rails flush with the chamfered surface of the jig. Remove the rails and clean off any burrs from top, bottom and both sides of the blades. I use fine wet and dry paper for this. Here are two pairs of switch blades. They're quite fragile. The holes in the toes of the lower pair of blades are for the operating system that I use. It also requires corresponding holes to be drilled in the stock rails. I'll describe this later. Now it's time to think about assembling the component parts into a working turnout. All of mine are built using stained ply sleepers and functional chairs. But before we go any further, a couple of comments on plain track, much of which will also be relevant to turnout assembly. Thinking about the order in which to proceed before you start will make life much easier. If only I'd always heeded my own advice on this, I would certainly have saved a lot of time. What follows refers to track constructed with functional chairs. First, chamfer the foot and web of the rail to make it easier to slide the chairs on. The underside of the foot should also be chamfered, but avoid chamfering the head. Next, if planning to joggle the rail for turnout construction, do that now but be aware that you will not be able to slide chairs past the joggle without breaking them. Then, if constructing curve track, form the best possible approximation of the curve between your thumb and forefinger. It doesn't have to be perfect. Likewise, for the curved switch and closure rails and the curved stock rail for a turnout. It's far easier to thread the chairs onto the rail if you leave them on the sprue. It's a good idea to think about where you intend to install the power feeds now. When the chairs have been threaded onto the rail and are approximately where they'll be on the finished track, place the rails on the track plan and decide where you want to drill holes in the baseboard for the power feeds. I attach three feeds for every metre length of rail, but some assert that this is being overcautious. It's certainly prudent to have two as a precaution against one failing. Mark the positions of the holes on the track plan, remove the rails and drill the holes. You can do this before or after gluing down the sleepers. Again, I use a plunge router for this. The holes produced are over large but can be filled when the droppers have been installed. Replace the rails on the plan and use a marker pen to indicate where the droppers will be soldered to the underside of the rails. 
Remove the rails and tin the undersides after first pushing the adjacent chairs away from the spot where the solder will be applied in order to avoid melting them. For straight track, I use a length of aluminium bar temporarily screwed to the baseboard to provide a guide for the alignment of the sleepers before gluing them in place. This is particularly useful if you're not using a template plan but laying directly onto the underlay. The rail can then be set in place and held with the gauges pinned to the track centre line. Three point gauges can be used but the Genzel gauges make it easier to keep the track straight, particularly if laying onto a template plan where the centre line is marked. I use butanone also known as methyl ethyl ketone or MEK to bond the chairs to the sleepers. Other solvents will do the trick but I've not tried the new formulation of MECPAC which I'm told is no longer MEK. I use a couple of heavy V blocks to hold the sleepers down while the glue dries and subsequently to hold the rail down while the chairs bond to the sleepers but a brick on a small sheet of MDF will do the trick just as well. I should say that the V-blocks do occasionally get used for the purpose for which they were intended. I use single strand wire for my droppers. Its lack of flexibility makes it ideal for the purpose because it can be bent as necessary. When installed it won't be under any stress. I have a range of colours to make tracing under the baseboards as easy as possible. After stripping the insulation off each end I use a pair of pliers to bend 3 or 4 millimetres to 90 degrees at one end and tin this section. The dropper wires can then be fed through the holes in the baseboard and oriented so that the bent section is parallel to the rail and soldered to it. If the hole is close enough to the edge of the baseboard I can hold the part of the wire protruding below it in my left hand and hold the soldering iron with my right hand, being as I am right handed. If it's not, I grip the wire above the baseboard with tweezers to hold in position while soldering. Before commencing construction of the turnout, it's necessary to give some thought as to how you plan to operate it when it's installed on the layout. There are many ways of doing this, and your choice will depend upon the degree of prototypical accuracy that you want to achieve. My layout has 21 turnouts, three single slips and a double slip so far and I still have a lot more to build so I decided long ago that a faithful representation of the prototype was not for me when it came to turnout operation. I originally used tortoise point motors under the baseboards with operating mechanisms based upon a design by Paul Willis. But because my baseboards are removable, this necessitated crawling underneath to line the operating mechanism up with the turnout. Not only is this difficult, but it's also conducive to severe backache or worse. Consequently, I have abandoned that method in favour of servo motors installed on the baseboard surface. They'll eventually be hidden under the scenery if I ever get as far as building it. The servo is coupled to a piano wire operating rod, the other end of which is connected to the turnout stretcher bar. This will be described in a later section of this presentation. This photograph shows the order of turnout assembly that I usually follow for simple turnouts. When constructing diamonds and slips, I usually use a different order by installing the two common crossings first. I built my work on a duplicate template plan off baseboard. The sleepers are held down with double sided adhesive tape along the track centre line. To remove the assembly I carefully wet the plan with turpentine which softens the glue on the tape and enables the unit to be detached. You can see that a couple of sleepers are not properly aligned. It's not difficult to detach the chairs from the relevant sleepers by carefully inserting a scalpel blade between chair and sleeper. They can then be easily realigned and the chairs reattached to the sleeper. I start by threading the check rail chairs onto the check rails and then threading the appropriate chairs and the check rails onto the two stock rails. Because of the joggle, 
the chairs on the stock rails must be slid on from the heel end. If you don't joggle the stock rail, the chairs can be slid on from whichever end is more convenient. Because of the way I drive my turnouts, it's desirable, though not essential, to drill 0.75mm holes through switch and stock rails before I start assembly. Here you can see that the holes are aligned using a lace maker's pin. I also solder two brass slide chairs to each stock rail as shown here. They will be attached to the sleepers with super glue. You can see that the switch and stock rails are bonded together with copper clad for electrical continuity. These are soldered to the stock rails and will subsequently be super glued to the sleepers, but not until they've been soldered to the closure rails. First, the straight stock rail to which the check rail was previously attached is glued to the sleepers, but without the plastic slide chairs which will be dealt with later. Then the prefabricated common crossing which is gauged from the straight stock rail. The curved stock rail with pre-attached check rail is gauged from the common crossing and at the toe end from the straight stock rail but is only attached to the sleepers shown here. The remaining chairs will be attached to the sleepers when the curved switch and closure rail is in place. And then the straight switch and closure rail which is gauged from the straight stock rail. Finally, the curved switch and closure rail. Plastic slide chairs are a problem as they usually fall off the rails even if super glued to them and have to be reinstalled after the track is laid. Exacto scale brass slide chairs can be soldered to the rail and super glued to the sleepers. Unfortunately, they're currently in very short supply. Moreover, using only brass slide chairs would make turnout construction a very expensive business. For this turnout, only the slide chairs on the two sleepers closest to the toe are brass. At this stage, it's a good idea to check the turnout with your mint gauge and then by running a wagon through it. This should certainly be done before the turnout is fixed down. If necessary, the turnout can be fettled. Plastic chairs can be persuaded to part from sleepers by prising gently with a scalpel if necessary. If you accidentally destroy the chair, which is difficult to do, you can replace it later with two cosmetic half chairs salvaged from those that you broke when threading them onto the rails. Soldered chairs can be unsoldered, at which point the superglue will also fail. Take care because it emits noxious fumes as it does so. When reaffixing, I find it necessary to weight the rail down for an hour or so as new superglue doesn't seem to like sticking to old cooked residue. Some of this can be done after the turnout is fixed down in place on the layout and wired up when you can also add the missing slide chairs and any cosmetic half chairs needed to disguise the absence of chairs on the sleepers to which copper clad was previously affixed. Most of these will be on the common crossing. But before doing this, the operating mechanism has to be decided upon and installed. The Hextronic HXT900 servo motors that I use are available from a number of suppliers including Hobby King, a Chinese enterprise which also has a warehouse in Australia. They're attached to my baseboards by homemade mounting brackets fabricated from 25 by 12 by 1.6 mm aluminium angle using a piece of steel angle as a jig. I believe that it's possible to purchase ready-made brackets but I prefer to make my own. The dimensions of the bracket will depend upon the size of the servo motor being used. In particular, its width and the distance between the centres of the mounting holes. This means that for the bracket, the critical dimensions are the width of the slot in the bracket, which should be such as to give a snug fit when the servo motor is inserted, and the distance between the holes that you drill to mount the servo. These are shown here in red. For other servo motors, they'll probably be different from those shown here. The other dimensions of the bracket can be changed to suit. Here you can see the steel jig and two completed brackets. 
Packing pieces are needed to elevate the brackets from the baseboard surface to allow clearance for the pivot arm to swing. I made the one on the left narrower for reasons that I can no longer remember. As you can see, neither the brackets nor the jig are precision engineered. That's because they don't need to be, though had I known that they'd be on public display, I might have been more careful. On the other hand... Anyway, if you plan to make several mounting brackets, the jig will save time and help to produce a neater job, but it's not essential. To use the jig to aid in fabricating the bracket, first clamp the jig inside the aluminium angle and then clamp the angle to a wooden block on the table of your pillar drill. Drill the first hole 3mm or whatever size is appropriate for the screws that you plan to use to fix the bracket to your baseboard. Remove the angle and the jig from the drill table and separate them. Clean up the area around the hole in the angle and then use a 6BA nut and bolt to reattach the jig to the angle. Actually, any convenient nut and bolt will do here, but I happen to have 6BA on hand, so my jig, and hence the bracket, were drilled 3mm as 6BA clearance. Now you can clamp the angle to your bench and use the jig to cut it to length as shown here, or you can drill the second hole and cut to length later. After drilling the second hole and cleaning it up, check with a second 6BA nut and bolt. Remove one nut and bolt or the other and clamp the jig and the angle to your bench. Using a hacksaw and the guide slots in the jig, make two cuts in the short side of the angle to enable subsequent removal of the section into which the servo will slot. This will probably necessitate swapping the nut and bolt that attach the jig to the angle before you can hold it down to make the second cut. Remove the angle from the jig and extend the two saw cuts to the full depth of that side of the angle and then clean up along the edges of the cuts. Using a fine saw blade and a piercing saw, remove the section of angle between the cuts to form the servo slot. Clamp the angle to the bench and clean up with a file, preferably one with a blind edge, extending the width of the slot as needed to give a snug fit for the servo. Keep testing the servo against the bracket for fit until satisfied. In use, the servo can be attached either in front of or behind the short side of the bracket. We now have to drill two 1.4mm fixing holes to fix the servo to the bracket. To do this, clamp the servo very gently into the bracket and using the holes in the servo as a guide, carefully drill the first hole in the bracket. The safest way to do this is to have the servo in front of the bracket as shown here and to start the hole with a 1.4mm drill in a pin vise. Then remove the servo and finish drilling the hole which can then be tapped 10BA. If using metric bolts, amend the tapping drill size accordingly. Alternatively, you could simply use a nut and bolt to secure the servo to the bracket and thereby avoid the need to tap the fixing holes. Replace the servo and, using a 10BA cheese head bolt to hold it in place, drill and tap the second hole as before. And here's the finished unit. To connect the servo to the stretcher bar on the turnout, I use piano wire and pushrod connectors from Great Plains in Illinois. If you know Illinois, you'll appreciate the pun, though the label tells me that they're actually made in Italy. Given the horrific cost of postage the second time I bought some, I might check in Italy if I need more. I sheathed the piano wire in evergreen plastic tubing to avoid any chance of producing a short circuit where it passes under any adjacent tracks on its way to the turnout. This shows the connector fixed to the pivot on the servo and the operating rod inserted. It's necessary to solder a short length of brass tube onto the piano wire as a sleeve to allow the bolt on the connector to grip the rod. As you can see, the plastic tube doesn't like the soldering iron. I was a bit slow in its application, but that doesn't really matter. An alternative way of doing this 
would be to fabricate or possibly source a clevis, solder it to the operating rod and run a 12BA bolt through it as shown here. The big disadvantage of doing this is that there is no possibility of adjusting the length of the operating rod. Doing it as shown in the photograph allows this by loosening the set screw and moving the rod towards or away from the turnout, provided of course that the sleeve is long enough to permit the necessary movement. I find this very convenient. Here's the servo installed and attached to the turnout stretcher bar. This is done in such a way as to make it easy to disassemble in order to facilitate setting the servo motor to give the correct throw to move the stretcher without the risk of destroying the turnout by overdoing it. I bent up the Omega loop from hard brass wire but I'm not convinced of the necessity for it. It's quite tricky to make and I have omitted it in subsequent builds. This is the homemade setup that I use for connecting the operating rod to the stretcher. As you can see, there's no possibility of adjusting the length of the operating rod at this end, but it can be disconnected, if necessary. A sleeve is soldered onto the end of the operating rod and into a short length of square brass tube. The square tube is soldered to a homemade clevis fabricated from a similar length of brass tube. This is attached to the stretcher bar by a cut down 0.75mm lace maker's pin. If you cut the pin in half, you can use the other half in another unit. The pin passes through the clevis, the stretcher and the support tube which were previously drilled 0.8mm. Hence the operating rod is not permanently fixed to the stretcher. My stretcher bars are made from gapped copper clad sleepers the width of which I reduced by filing in a rather crude jig made from scrap steel that spent most of its life in my might be useful one day box. Droppers, again made from 0.75mm lace makers pins, are soldered to the web of the switch blades and pass through the stretcher bar. This shows a hastily set up arrangement of operating rod, clevis, pin and stretcher. The units that I've installed are a little more elegant. Honestly, they really are, but it occurs to me that the fact that the pin is not actually perpendicular to the other components doesn't really matter as long as it holds the mechanism together and can be removed if necessary. This is the jig with a copper clad sleeper inserted ready for filing together with three that have already been filed. The top one has been drilled to accept the droppers but has yet to be drilled for the pin that will connect to the clevis on the operating rod. Most of my drilling and filing ends with rubbing the item in question on this 1200 grit wet and dry paper glued to yet another piece of scrap MDF. Below this is the jig that I use for making the first bend in the dropper. The jig isn't essential but it does ensure that the section of the dropper that will be soldered to the web of the switch rail is the same for every dropper. It doesn't guarantee a 90 degree bend, but that can be fettled later. This shows the dropper still in the jig with the second bend made. Clearly this isn't correct because the short projecting length which will pass through the switch and stock rails isn't perpendicular to the long section which will pass through the stretcher. This is easily fixed by adjusting it after removal from the jig. You can see four droppers that I've bent up, but photographic distortion makes the two on the left look like they need adjusting. Because of the double bend, these droppers are handed. It isn't essential to go to the trouble of drilling the rails and bending the droppers in this way, but it's a belt and braces approach of ensuring that the switch rail can't kick up after being installed. These two droppers are the simpler version. Also shown are two of the collars that are soldered to the legs of the droppers after they're installed on the turnout and the 16th inch outside diameter tube from which they're cut. As you can see, a little bit of tube goes a very long way. These collars are to prevent the stretcher from sliding down the dropper. Not that it can go very far because one end is held by the clevis and pin. <laughs> 
If you don't like the idea of drilling through the rails to allow the dropper to pass through them and to prevent the blade from kicking up, the collar alone will serve this purpose, provided that it's sufficiently close to the stretcher bar and the bar is in contact with the rails. There should be a minuscule gap between the top of the collar and the underside of the stretcher to prevent them from binding. This is a bent up dropper, much enlarged and showing that the end needs to be cleaned up. Both ends will be cut to length when the dropper is installed. Although the shadow on the end makes it look like tube, it is in fact rod. I doubt that one could bend tube like this. To make it easier to solder the dropper to the switchblade, it's helpful to insert the dropper into a 0.8mm hole drilled into yet another piece of MDF and to push the switchblade up against it as is shown here. Before doing this, I file a small nick in the foot of the switchblade to allow it to seat more snugly. The scrap of paper that you see is to remove the very slight risk of getting solder where it definitely isn't wanted. This shows the droppers with their collars soldered on. This turnout was actually built before I changed from using tortoise point motors to servos and the stretcher is due for replacement with a longer one. It isn't difficult to unsolder the collars, clean off the solder residue and remove the stretcher. I use the push rod connector to operate a micro switch to change the frog polarity. This can be problematic because the throw is so small. You can see here two solutions that I've adopted. The operating arm of the micro switch on the left has been significantly reduced in length and on the right you can see that I've used a much smaller micro switch which, of course, came from China. It's possible to operate two micro switches simultaneously as you can see here where the second switch, not yet wired up, is to illuminate a light emitting diode to indicate the position of the turnout on the yet to be built control panel. In future, I plan to dispense with this second switch and to use electronics to perform that function and to interlock the turnouts to prevent setting up conflicting routes. But that is another story, and it's also the end of this one. So thank you for watching. As I said at the outset, the methods that I've demonstrated here are those that I've developed over the years, and I know that they won't appeal to everyone, particularly to those who want absolute fidelity to prototype in their track work. Nevertheless, you might find one or two suggestions that could be helpful.